Squan, squan, You know there are people out there who thought this was a boring game. On first viewing, as a Wales fan, this was a relentless multi-hour heart attack, watching as our dream of taking our best ever chance at Rugby World Cup faded in and out and then eventually out once and before all. But watching it a second and third time as a rugby fan, this was the tightest contest I've seen in years. An incredible stalemate where two teams did everything to cancel each other out at what I believe was the highest mutual intensity of the entire tournament. I don't know if anyone remembers this scrum from a few years ago. On the surface, it looks like nothing is happening, but in reality, that's because there's such colossal effort, power, and technique being applied that neither side can get an edge, neither side can go forward. Props and rugby hardcores loved it. And for me, Wales against South Africa in the 2019 Rugby World Cup semi-final was like that scrum stretched out for an entire game. This almost felt like a tennis match, a back and forth with either side desperate to break the other team's serve, only for the match to end on 80 minutes, with advantage firmly on the South African side. Perceptions become, Wales were not good enough to win this game, or because they lost in the end. And this is backed up by the stats, by virtually every single statistic. South Africa dominated everything. The Chunky Bot Boys made about 100 metres more than Wales of 40 fewer carries. They crossed the game line a pretty astounding 92% of the time. Their tackle completion was 93% to Wales' 82, and they turned over Wales a remarkable 15 times. If you to look at it objectively, if you're to judge off what we can see and count, Wales were comprehensively outmuscled, outmatched, outskilled, outscrummed, and outplayed. South Africa with a better rugby team. And yet, this was possibly the tightest game of the tournament, and when Razi Rasmus said himself, he still felt could go out of the way even after Hardry Pollard kicked this late penalty. So how the hell did Wales manage to keep it so close during an 80 in which they should have been flattened harder than Faf de Klerk would be if he'd played in the 80s? The answer is one no stats package will ever tell you. South Africa were dominant but they were out fought. The Springboks were on top in all traditional aspects of play, but Wales had Warren Gatland. Whilst Razi Erasmus has devised an excellent game plan that really, really works, and I'll go more into it later in this week, because in between me writing this and me editing this video, they went and won the bloody World Cup, Warren Gatland has become the absolute king of the counter. South Africa has done very little to hide how they play. Since Erasmus took over, he's essentially developed two different styles of play, two different game plans, one built around speed, which was used this year against the likes of Canada and Australia, and then the territory-based power game that's been the default during these knockouts. He's then refined rather than adapted them. As such, Gatland has had a pretty good idea what he's going to face, and he got a chance to work out exactly what he's going to do in response. Now, I've talked about Springboks quite a lot in the last year, and I've described plenty of components of their game individually in separate videos in the past, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through them quite quickly. It may seem, you know, quite blunt or simplistic explanations, but that's because what I want to focus on is how Gatlin got round them, how Wales worked out the Springboks. I also recognise this may sound one-sided, and especially since Wales is the team I support, so, you know, it'll always be a crucial bias there, but it's simply the nature of the game. The things the Springboks did well are easy enough for any observer to point out, whereas the things Wales did well to match them kind of require a bit more talking. Regardless of how entertaining you found the game, you probably noticed there were quite a few occasions on which ball hit boot. I've talked before about South Africa's zone-led strategy. The idea is to always be moving forward. If momentum stops, they thump it. If they get trapped somewhere where they don't have many attacking options, they thump it. If they're in their own 22, they thump it. If Faf de Klerk wants a moment to do his hair, they thump it. Gatlin knew this and used this as part of his attack. South Africa's defence, on the other hand, works like this. Aggressive blitz, usually led by the third man, usually, in the line to put maximum pressure on the attack. Then, if the ball does manage to get any wider than that man here, they use their winger to shoot in at a diagonal angle and kill the play from outside the attacker's eye line. In the way most teams use a 13, they use their winger. If the winger is unavailable, if he's back covering a kick, then Faf de Klerk fills in, because this man on the outside is the fulcrum of their defence. He's the key man in the system, so Gatlin knew he was who he had to target. And the easiest way to do this is just to make him think. This system works best when the winger can come in and be decisive, when he can just shoot in and do something. BAM! Now the pass you're about to see drifts forwards, but just look at how much space Wales create by Jonathan Davis just holding the ball a half second longer than usual and making Nkosi think about where to shoot. The ball then goes out to Adams, and had the pass been backwards, there would have been a lot of space there to exploit. Here, Wales play one phase of crash board set up in the middle of the line-out, then they pull a set play. The field is set up in a standard forward formation, 
ready to crash it up a few more phases, except these aren't forwards, these are backs! Oh, they scored them there! Wales are facing a defensive line set to defend carries with, you know, one winger here to shoot in if they try and get wide, but instead, what look like pods disassemble into backs into being an army of runners who can all distribute, and they all go right at the wing. This gives Unkosi lots and lots of options, lots of information he has to decode before making a decision. He takes just a second to a Minara over it, and that's all they need for Wales to get the ball to George North. They've brought him round, they've hidden him, getting him round to this side into plenty of space. This move instead targets the gap on the inside of the guy leading the line. So, Bigger moves round to the blind side. He then, as the play is called, deliberately late, flashes round onto the open side, with Halfpenny coming deliberately later to target the space as being unguarded by the box. They have one man drift in, whilst the others are flying up to try and close down the space and force Wales backwards if they play the standard play. Again, this pass goes forwards, but if it comes off, Wales have three support runners here, ready to be on Halfpenny's shoulder, and it could potentially be one offload away from a try scoring opportunity. You'll notice as well, on all three of the attacks I pulled out there, and basically any other chance where Wales found space throughout the rest of the game you want to look at, this was off second phase. Wales would play one to generate momentum, usually Hadley Park throwing Watkin up the middle, and then out it comes. The more phases Wales played, the further backwards and hence less dangerous they became. This is where Wales' kicking game came in. Wales were making very little ground of carries. So, they started kicking into positions in which they knew South Africa would kick it back. Wales' kicking game is normally all about the chase, but on Sunday, they focus equally on positioning, on pinning South Africa into positions in which protocol would take over. This allowed the attack to reset, to look to play those two phases again in order to find that space. And it wasn't only space in the main line. Wales kicked for South Africa to return it here, and then when the box inevitably do so, Wales are instantly looking to well here again because South Africa's backfield is still resetting. Dwayne Vermeulen is acting as a sweeper, and this gives them prime opportunity to send Dan Bigger, their best chaser, up to gather. He does gather, he offloads, and this almost puts George North in for a chance. Wales also toyed with the wingers, trying to pull them up and down regularly, running down with Pimpy's wing off two scrums in a row, making significant yardage to encourage him to come up and cover that, but then kicking directly to him moments later, making him think about dropping deep instead, or using these horizontal cross kicks to try and keep the wingers flat when they're wanting to shoot in and hit a man in the outside channel. There are threats throughout the South African team, but they're all drilled to play game plan first, instinct second. This isn't a problem, this got them to a World Cup final here, and eventually won the World Cup, spoilers! So Wales nullified them by forcing them into situations in which they couldn't be themselves for fear of bollocking from Big Dick Razzie. South Africa, on the other hand, didn't do this. Wales played the entire second half and the last few minutes of the first half with Owen Watkins on the wing. Now, I'm an Ospreys fan, so I've watched basically every professional game Owen Watkins ever played, and to my knowledge, he's played on the wing once. Jonathan Davis shared some responsibilities, and again, having watched him play 200 odd times, I've seen him play on the wing once. South Africa did nothing to try and exploit this. You can bet if it had been the other way around, Gatlin would have exploited that mercilessly. This all begs the question of why, if they were so tactically on top, did Wales not beat South Africa? And that's exactly the problem, because the tactical game was the only area in which Wales had any edge. They fought thoroughly of how to beat South Africa, but this Welsh team lacked the power of their Green and Gout counterpart, and from a fitness perspective, they were verging on spent. Top tier rugby is essentially a 50-50 mashup of chess and sumo wrestling. It's chess boxing if the two of them were done at the same time, but there was no way Wales were ever going to win the wrestle. South Africa were never being shoved out of that ring, and it was Wales' job just to remain in there as long as possible, just to stay in there for 74 minutes took basically all their energy. Because ultimately, while the other side had their speciality, South Africa were better at chess than Wales were at sumo. This is where the Welsh injury count comes in. However, it's not due to a lack of talent being on the pitch. Much as I think Anand's Kerm or a Fowler Tower or Alice Jenkins might have made a difference, it was more because of the sheer fatigue this caused the Welsh players. Gatland had worked very hard to build a 35-ish man squad who could compete for a World Cup. He'd made a point in previous games, as I've talked about before, of blooding new players and making sure that players that would be second or third choice had all played against Australia, England, Ireland, the big teams they'd be playing in this World Cup. However, 10 or so of that 35 then went and got injured. This left Wales needing to play basically the same 20 free against not just Australia and France, the two big games, but also Georgia and Fiji, possibly the two most physically trying tier 2 nations of them all. This meant the entire team came in to this semi-final having played a ridiculous number of very attritional minutes. Look at Hadley Parks for instance, I mean look at Hadley Parks! He broke a bone in his hand in game 1 and yet now he's playing his 6th game in 4 and a half 
weeks, Wales were a good enough team to reach that final. And Warren Gatland is more than a good enough coach to come up with a plan to stop England again. But frankly, they were too tired to execute with the accuracy required at this higher level. South Africa on the other hand had no such issue because Erasmus is the master of timing a change. On the surface, it might seem like a mad thing to do to bring off your massively inspirational captain when the game is all tied up in a World Cup semi-final, but let's look at Siakalisi's last involvement in the game. He doesn't really make an impact to this ruck, it's a passive clear out, he's just sort of there. And so Erasmus just hauls him off because he's seen the very first sign of tiredness. This might seem like an insult at any lower level, but at this level, he's being cautious. Khaleesi easily could have played another 15 minutes and made all of his tackles, caught and carried every ball that went his way, but he's going to be maybe 3 or 4% less effective than he would have been at the start of the game just from having played those 65 minutes. And in a game this close, at this higher level, those 3 or 4% might be all they need. And so Francois Lowe comes on for him, and that 4% proves to be exactly the difference. This turnover wrecking Wales a chance and leads eventually to the three points that put the box in the final. This game came down to one clear out. Wales were just three or four percent less effective at one ruck and they lost their chance at a final. Erasmus is paid to make big calls like this and by doing so he made sure that this ruck did not happen the other way around. Because these are the margins at this level. It was so stupidly tight, it feels daft to suggest there was more than a percent between the teams, but it was sheer drama, the hard fought with an F against the hard fought with a TH. And in the end, sheer power and inspirational drive narrowly won out over smarts with heart. Now, I can understand someone not wanting to watch this game three or four times, but I can't quite understand how anyone would describe that billing as boring. Hello. Um, that is the second semi-final wrapped up. Now we move on to the final of the 2019 Rugby World Cup. That is what is coming next. I am currently trying to work out a means, a way in which to get the video up to YouTube. Um, the plan was always to migrate back there after the end of the World Cup. However, there's been some unforeseen difficulties with that beyond on top of what was already happening. Um, so the problem, I'm going to work on that. Um, there's currently a Squidge Rugby website, if you want to head to squidgeproductions.co.uk, there's got an archive of all the videos I've made during this World Cup, because a lot of them got pulled down from Vimeo, uh, where you are most likely watching this one. Um, so that's what's going on at the minute. As I say, I'm trying to work this out, and I'm trying to get through all of this in the hope of hopefully clearing every game from the World Cup, from covering all of them. So the plan is, move on to the final next. Once the final's done, once I've got through the final, congratulations to South Africa, um, I will go back through the other pool games I missed, Climaxing, finishing on Japan v Scotland. The last game for the pool, that'll be the last game I cover. And then I'm going to go and have a very long lie down because I'm quite tired. Um, so that's the plan. I'm going to try to work out how to get them on YouTube and then, you know, finish these and get and have a, have a break. That's basically the idea. Hopefully that makes sense and I'll see you very soon, hopefully, for a video on the final.